sheds light on a bunch of different objections. But I'll leave that up for another second for those of you who want to write it down. Mark 10.35, Matthew 20.20. 20. Check that out. Read it for yourself. So once you understand the way this kind of language is used, you can resolve apparent difficulties of this sort by yourself. Let's go to number six. This is all, we're almost to the end, so hang tight. John 2, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem and chases the money changers and the animal versions out of the temple with a whip. That's at the beginning of his ministry. It happens just after he turns the water into wine at Cana. Matthew 21, 12, and other passages in the Synoptic Gospels. We call the first three the Synoptic Gospels because they all kind of look over the same events, whereas John gives us some extra things not found in them. Jesus chases the money changers and animal merchants out of the temple at the end of his ministry. Are these two passages, descriptions of the same event? Well, let's go back to that story that I was telling you about the two biographies of Jonathan Edwards. Remember those? All those details were there just perfectly in sync. But then you hit the date of his birth, and one of them says 1758, and the other says 1801. And at 43 years is just too big a chunk of time. They can't both be right. They must be wrong. They're both completely true. Strange as it seems. All the facts listed are true of two different men, a father and a son, both named Jonathan Edwards. If I made that up, you would have been, I think, very skeptical, saying, well, you can, you can pretend that a story happened like that, but I mean, in real life. Yeah, actually, in real life, coincidences happen much more commonly than we're inclined to think. These two guys had this amazing parallelism in their lives, right down to preaching the sermon on the passage in Jeremiah that says, this year you will die, and then doing it. Every detail. Now, if I were to wait a few centuries, perhaps some clever scholar would come along, note all these similarities, and say, well, clearly these, uh, these are the same person, and one source has just got the date wrong. But no, they're two different people. And they've been conflated to make it seem to us that there was only one, but actually they are two different people. Now there's nothing wrong with assuming provisionally that two different accounts that are very similar are accounts of the same person or the same event. That might be the simplest explanation, but when otherwise reliable sources close to the event also report different details or settings, it's reasonable to ask whether maybe they refer to two distinct events. So as far as the cleansing of the temple is concerned, I think the most reasonable answer is we've got sources up close to the events that are telling us about this. Yes, there are coincidences between the two accounts, but they're less striking than the coincidences between the two biographies of the two Jonathan Edwardses. And the differences in time are very clearly described. So for my money, since the gospel authors have shown themselves to be reliable in other respects, they deserve the benefit of the doubt here. There are other plausible instances of conflation. For example, what's the location of the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5 through 7 tells us he goes up uh, into the mountain and sits down. Luke 6, well, he's talking on a plane. I think material that is in Matthew 5 through 7 is probably gathered from several different discourses that Jesus gave. That would be completely in keeping with Greco-Roman biography. So the next time you hear somebody sneering about the Sermon on the Mount versus the Sermon on the Plain, what we have in Matthew 5 through 7 is very plausibly a pulling together of things. If you check out the parallel passages in Luke, they're scattered around in different settings. Luke has gone and tried to find out where the original setting was. Matthew has given you all of the teaching at once. The anointing of Jesus with perfume. Uh, here, I think the differences in these accounts suggest that they're not all one event. Uh, talk about that more if you like. Last one. How did Judas die? Matthew 27 tells us Judas threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests then bought a field with the money. In Acts chapter 1, 
Peter says, Judas acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness falling headlong. He burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. There's a Halloween gruesome picture for you. Well, how could these both be true? Have you ever fallen headlong? Has anybody ever done that? And any of you guys skateboarding or anything, go, or taking a trip over your bicycle handlebars or any other spectacular things? Did all your bowels gush out? No? Really? Why not? Well, because even falling and falling pretty hard normally does not make human beings splash when they hit the ground. Unless the body's been dead and is decomposing. And then, yeah, that can happen. So there's a curious clue. Is falling down with all those bowels gushing out doesn't sound like something that would happen to a living human being. So we got two issues here. How did he die? By hanging or by falling? And number two, who purchased the field? Judas himself or the high priests? First one, it's what we would expect, the description that we get of his falling headlong and his bowels gushing out. Sorry, gross image, I know. It's in the Bible, I didn't make it up. Uh, that's what we'd expect if Judas was already dead and it was his dead body that fell. And also if he fell from some height. Now, it turns out that there are cliffs growing along the edge of the Valley of Hinnom, and there are olive trees growing along the cliffs. If somebody wanted to hang himself, going out onto a limb of one of those trees and hanging himself from a limb would leave his body dangling. And it's between 25 to 40 feet straight down below, over the edge of the cliff and down to the bottom. Very rocky and sharp down there. It's plausible that that's where Judas hung himself, and that's what happened to the body. Okay, but who purchased the field? Well, remember the case of the centurion. An action done by someone's authority or through his provision is considered to be his action. There's even an old legal maxim, a bit of Latin. He who acts through another does the act himself. So if I hire a hitman to kill my cousin, I am guilty of murder. Why? Because I provided the money. That was at my instigation and on my authority that the action was carried out. Well, who provided the money for the purchase of that field? Where did the priests get the money? Oh, yeah. Matthew says that Judas went and flung the money into the temple. And then what did the priests say? Well, we can't just put this into the treasury now. It's blood money. It's been used for procuring someone's death. Let's, let's buy a field with it. But who provided the money? It's that usage again. Someone provides the means whereby something can be done. He's said to do it himself. You see the, the way that that comes back around? That theme comes back around? So here's just a summary of the contradictions we've considered here. Matthew and Luke present conflicting genealogies. No, that's a conflation of two distinct genealogies. Close reading of the one in Luke shows that it's Mary's ancestry, not Joseph's. Matthew claims that Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great, but Luke claims Jesus was born during the census of Quirinius. No, that's carelessness in reading Luke, ignoring the fact that Luke already knows the dates of these things. Matthew has Mary and Joseph living in a house in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. No, he doesn't. Read the text. Mark says Jesus had a disciple named Thaddeus, but he doesn't list Judas. Luke lists Judas, but not Thaddeus. Looks like two names for the same person. That was very common. Some knowledge of the cultural context helps us there. Matthew says the centurion came to Jesus himself. Luke says he sent messengers. Cultural context. This is a figure of speech used all throughout the literature of the time. He's said to be doing it himself if people come on his authority. That's the way the phrase was understood. Well, how about the cleansing of the temple? Looks like two different events. One at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, one at the end. Finally, how did Judas die and who purchased the field? Well, you look at the geographical context, we get a plausible reconciliation of the two accounts. Consider, consideration of the same principle with the centurion resolves the question of who purchased the field. So what can we conclude? Well, as far as these alleged contradictions are concerned, people who charge that the Gospels are hopelessly contradictory haven't made their case. And here's the important thing. I'm going to drive this one home here and then I'll stop. What's your best way of being sure 
that what you are reading is true, that this is an authentic account of real events. I'm not asking what's your best way if you turn out to become a great scholar and master biblical languages and spend years poring over this stuff. Right? We all know then what your grounds are. You read it all for yourself. But what if you're not? What if your ambitions are not to become that? You have other ambitions. You want to become a mother. You want to be a plumber. You want to do so, you know, maybe youth work, but not youth work that requires three PhDs. Your best ground is not simply that your pastor says it's true. Your best ground is that people have done all that ingenuity and malice can rake together to attack these texts, and the attacks don't work. They've done the work for you. They've made the attack, and if it fails, and if you, with common sense and maybe a little help occasionally from some resources, can show that it doesn't work, or can see for yourself that it doesn't work, then you can be confident that the silver bullet is not out there, the magic attack on the Bible that's going to make it all explode. These are the objections that intelligent people have tried to raise. If they fail, it's a good bet that there's no better attack out there. There are a lot of attacks. I've got five books up here. You're welcome to browse these after we're done. Um, all of them dealing with Bible difficulties alleged contradictions, alleged historical errors. This is just a small sample from my library. I've got lots more where those came from. But these have all been gone over before. People have looked at these before. If they can't make the case, then you can be confident that it's true. So we can reconcile these either decisively, in some cases just saying, hey, you're not understanding the way language is used, or plausibly without straining. If you want more, there's a website and a Facebook page. You can go to historicalapologetics.org. There's a little Browse the Library tab. We've got resources. Some of these books are available there for free downloading. None of it's pirated. It's all public domain. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go to the Library of Historical Apologetics, and we've got a page where we put up little nuggets of biblical knowledge and, and reconciling contradictions and other things there. Peter, do we have a few minutes to Yes. Do you. Do so. Anybody got any questions about anything, either that we went over or something else you came in with, I would be happy to talk about it. So go ahead. Yes. In the Old Testament, the Jews use animal sacrifices, but then in the New Testament it says that that's not proper to do animal sacrifices. So right. how does that work? How does that work? Well. In the New Testament, at the beginning, you still have them doing sacrifices. So look at Matthew 5, for example, when Jesus is talking about what you should do. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're angry with your brother, there's a little phrase slipped in there that's kind of interesting. You have heard, he says, 521, that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever, uh, oops, Am I looking at the right place? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, i got to keep going. Uh, I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, and then what's that next bit in verse 23? If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift. So at the beginning, they're still bringing the sacrifices. Jesus' parents bring the offering of poor people to offer when they bring him to the temple. The uh, Last Supper, they sacrifice the Paschal Lamb. So what happened between there and the book of Hebrews where we're told the sacrifice has been offered once? Well, who's the sacrifice that's been offered once? Jesus himself. That's what distinguishes Christianity from Judaism. All of the sacrifices, all of the blood of lambs, was pointing towards something. And it's only in hindsight that you can see it and realize that was all pointing toward the final sacrifice. And once that was done, the sacrificial system was over. It was no more obligated. Did the Jews keep doing it? They did for about 40 years 
until the year 70 when the Romans besieged, broke through, and sacked Jerusalem and destroyed it so completely that according to the Jewish historian Josephus, except for one wall, which they left to provide a little shelter from the wind, you could not tell the place had ever been inhabited. So Christianity is a change, and it's worth thinking about that. All of the original Christians were devout Jews. What moved them to change the whole system? To give up the sacrificial system? To change their day of worship from the Sabbath, which is Saturday, to Sunday, the Lord's Day, as they called it, as you find it called in various places in the New Testament and later. Something changed. Something so great that it made them overturn the way that the Mosaic Law had been set up and worship God in a different way. And if you're thinking about that, you might go back to John 4, where Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. She says, well, you know, we're Samaritans. We worship in a temple we've got here on this mountain, but you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, what does he say to her? Time is coming when neither in Jerusalem nor in this mountain will you worship God, but those who worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus himself foretells the ending of worship at Jerusalem, which has to mean the end of the sacrificial system. So that's why there's that dividing line there. That's really the line that separates Judaism from Christianity. The old covenant from the new. It's a good question. Anybody else? Depend on it. At some point in the next year, probably in the next month, somewhere you will notice someone raising an objection that is either one of the ones we've looked at or very much like it. It will happen. Now that you've heard this lecture, you're going to hear more things and be sensitized to them. Remember the principles. Remember to check the context. Read the verse for yourself. Learn a little bit about the historical context. Ask yourself, could we be conflating two different events or confusing two things that are really the same thing? Check these things out. Use those methods. This will resolve most of these things for you. If you run across one you can't answer, ask your pastor. Ask Dr. Wheelhauer. Ask me. Get my email address. You can send it to anybody who wants it. Get help. Don't try to go solo. Get, get some help. Find out how to assess this and analyze this on your own. That is the proper way to deal with alleged contradictions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.